Wednesday of this week, our AC went out. Uh, that's not exactly in the terms of suffering for Jesus, is it? <laughs> uh, but when you're used to the humidity being low and the temperature being low and suddenly you're confined to the house and it keeps warming up, I called the repair man, great repair man came and said, I can get to that as soon as the part comes in and the part can come in on Monday. <laughs> so... Uh, I thought, well, we could retreat to the basement because the basement's cool. I went down to the basement and it wasn't cool. And it turns out that the AC unit was kind of supplementing for the dehumidifier that had conked out I don't know how long ago because the uh, AC unit was doing such a great job. The uh, dehumidifier decided it could retire permanently. So <laughs> I'm out shopping for a dehumidifier that I didn't want to buy for a new compressor that I didn't want to buy. <laughs> uh, and I don't know about you, but after a while, these things kind of pile up on you, you know? So I thought, I have a wonderful gift card that somebody from church had given us. I think this is time to not just phone a friend, this is go take the plastic to the place. So I called it in, and I anticipated that the checkout was going to be one way, and it turned out to be quite a different way. I did have to get out of my vehicle and stand on the line to determine if I was worthy enough to receive my food, apparently. I'm not sure. I wasn't in the best frame of mind to evaluate these things. And as I finally got up to the window where I was going to be able to go up and receive my food and get back home and get this meal before it got too chilly, uh, the food would be chilly. We would not be. But uh, anyway... Uh, somebody came up that looked a little distressed and asked if he could jump line. And, of course, being the holy man of God that I am, I mean, I'm, I'm seminary trained. I'm just naturally godly with all this stuff. Uh, or not. Uh, <laughs> I, I found myself kind of grinding, but I knew what his situation was. He had previously been where I was, had picked up his order, discovered it wasn't all there. And I said, yeah, go ahead, jump in. And so while he jumped in, which took entirely too long, by the way, uh, it was just to get a couple of gallons of uh, drink, that, uh, iced tea, I think it was, that it was left out of his order. There was a whole conversation going on with me, and it was not really a pleasant one. And what came to mind as I kind of ground in the groveling and complaining of my day and the heat and the humidity was a psalm I had just finished reading, Psalm 150, that says, let everything that has life and breath praise the Lord. I didn't need to remember the whole psalm, apparently. <laughs> I just needed that phrase, because I'd spent a lot of time on that psalm, and what had impressed me was that praise is not something superficial like a little box you can check. That it, for it to be praise that God receives as a, a worthy sacrifice, it has to come from a heart that is delighting in Him. And a heart that says, there's none like you. And I think that even applies when I'm waiting to get my free food <laughs> that somebody else graciously provided and somebody else jumped in and I could either extend grace to them and understanding or I could make them the topic of complaining and I found out that that time spent in the Psalms was invaluable for me to get my mind right. Apparently there are a few lessons I must have slept through in seminary because I keep having to learn them again and again. How about you? Does this time grind on you? Why do you suppose God has given us this moment in our lives, which now has stretched on for what almost six months it seems like, I wonder if there aren't lessons that we're going to learn best in this scenario, in these times that we need to desperately... I, I think one that we already celebrated this morning is the need to make personal connections. Even if it takes effort to make those connections, we need to reach out, and we need to phone a friend, and uh, our fellowship will be tighter and our support will be stronger because of what was inconvenient. Now we have to go out of our way, and we should have been doing that all along. Grace to people who are, well, they're missing their iced tea. That might be an important lesson for us too. And so I thought today as we have a little break, we're going to be starting the book of Daniel in a couple of weeks. Uh, and it's going to be an amazing preparation for the Christmas season, by the way. <laughs> 
We have two weeks to fill in, this week and next week, and what I thought we would do is I want to give you some gleanings from my times in the Psalms, but uh, there's 150 Psalms and I have two Sundays. So what I want to do is give you Psalm 1 this week, which is the introduction of the whole book of Psalms, and then I want to go to that Psalm 150 about let everything that has life and have breath praise the Lord, and it, it too has a strategic role in the book of Psalms. And the reason I want to go there is quite frankly, because what we see here is a whole manual for how we can relate to God in all the pages of our life. On the good days, on the bad days, on the angry days, on the days that we feel guilty, on the days that we are full of joy, every one of those lessons is taught and shown how we can take those pages of our lives and turn them into a worship activity before our God. And I don't know about you, but I need that because apparently I didn't learn all that stuff in seminary. It gave me holy man of God standing. Huh? (laughs) Well, it didn't make me holy, and it didn't necessarily make me a man of God. Because that course is going on today. Well, I want to talk to you about change my heart today, and uh, forgive me for peering over my shoulders, but something happened between my house and here with my laptop. So, Uh, I'm going to peek over here. Psalm 1 is an introduction of the whole book of Psalms. Uh, Fee and Stewart in their book, How to Read the Bible for All of Its Worth, kind of a classic now. It was kind of new, not a few decades ago. But it it says that Psalm teaches us how to worship God with every page of our life, how we can turn it into interaction with God. And that's an important lesson for us to get if we're going to be God worshipers. And so you find themes like mourning and celebration and anger, betrayal, ecstasy, confusion, wisdom, guilt, despair, forgiveness, renewal. Have we hit one that is relevant for you yet? Well, all that and more in the course of Psalms, and all find God, all those conditions find God in the Psalms. They don't necessarily start that way. Some of them start as a gripe session. And then David says, then I remembered where I was. (laughs) And we need to remember where we are. And so I go to uh, COVID days. And uh, with that, God brings us to this time in our life. Is this where I go bing bong and you change the slide? There we go. My experience for the last three years with the Psalms uh, has been a most instructive and helpful thing. And I'm sharing with you a little bit today just to encourage you to try something different uh, in your own time with the Lord. Uh, What I did is I camped out on one psalm a week, which meant if there were 150 psalms, how many weeks would that be? It's not tough math, is it? (laughs) Basically three years. And so for three years, I've been walking through the psalms, and I spend one week on a psalm, and I read it each day, and I also get involved with journaling and writing that down, because when I think through a sin or a promise or example or a command or a knowledge of myself or of God, it makes more sense to me if I have to write it down and express it and, and commit it to language, and then it really helps me to distill that thought, especially if I'm doing it with this thought of I'm going to, wanting to apply what God says and not be a, a hearer who walks away like a man who sees his face in the mirror and forgets what he looked like. And so for me, it's been a, a challenging time. It's been an important discipline, but it's also been, for me, Uh, a time of incredible growing. It even helps me when I'm waiting to pick up my food while masked in the hot, sweating sun. Uh, Oh, by the way, I missed a lot of days. My journal will reflect that. There'll be gaps once in a while. I'll blame it on grandkids who invade my space, okay? And they demand uh, chocolate chip pancakes at hours that I'm usually sitting having reverent time with God but now I'm fixing pancakes. And there might be some other reasons why I have some gaps in there. But here's the thing I discovered. God met me consistently. God met me consistently. It didn't always start off that way as the hour started, but as I applied my heart, as God nudged me further and further to go deeper and not give up, he always showed up, he always spoke. And I'm not sure where you are in your own relationship with Jesus today. We want to encourage you to be a Jesus follower, to take God's word seriously, to not try to get by simply on sermons or sermonettes that you hear on Sunday morning or on a radio broadcast, but you dig in for yourself because those lessons that God is teaching you from there and applying directly to your life are going to change you. 
You see, God's word implanted in the heart of his child changes us. And nothing can take, I can no more take that place than I can chew your food for you. Isn't that a wonderful thought? (laughs) You need to chew your own spiritual food that you'll put on the muscles and your mind will be renewed because when we think God's thoughts and think His truth, the errors and the distortions are exposed in our lives. And as those things become clear, our values begin to change and our behaviors begin to change and our speech begins to change. Because this God who has taken residence in our life by grace is going to clean every room in the house until we're fit for His presence by the grace of God and the sacrifice of Christ for us. The blood of an eternal covenant. So this work goes on. We want to talk real quickly from Psalm 1 about an invitation that you've received, a decision you have to make, a delight you can foster, a future that you can possess, and a promise you can cling to. I don't know if we can get five things done in the time we have remaining, but we're going to do it our best, okay? So let's look at Psalm chapter 1, and we're going to walk through, first of all, this invitation. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. I think it's like the third different version you've heard this morning of this psalm. This is the New International, the newest version of the New International. And you notice that it says the one, it doesn't say the man, because the man is generic, mankind, humanity, which includes men and women. And so they've seen fit to expand that by just saying the one. Make sense to you? You okay with that? We, We can stop right here if you're not. Because that would include every one of us, right? (laughs) If we know Jesus is Lord and Savior, if we've come to Him, blessed is this one, this person who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. I want to camp out on that word blessed for just a second because there's a couple different words in Hebrew that are used for blessed. We need to comment on this one to understand why it's an invitation that's being given. Blessed reflects a Hebrew word in this particular case that's only used by people to refer to other people. Now there's a distinct word that's translated bless in our New Testament translations for a word that we speak to God in praise. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Different verb, different word in Hebrew. This particular one in Psalm 1 is used by people, for people, of people, and it has to do apparently with a sense of admiration and even longing. My friend Tom started doing Bible study with a couple that he had met. They were living together. It was living in an apartment complex. They were opening to learning more about God through his word. And so Tom began to relate to this couple. They came to faith in Christ Jesus. He later had the opportunity to to officiate their marriage. (laughs) So cool to see them grow in Christ. One day as he was leaving Bible study, another couple who lived down the hall from couple number one said, "Um, could you do for us what you've done for them. Because we've been watching them, and we'd like that in us too. (laughs) Isn't that great to see how God does a work in our hearts that includes our relationships? They had a sense of admiration and longing. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one that has these kinds of desires, these kinds of priorities, this kind of love for God's Word. Do you ever encounter this phrase in Scripture? Come to me, all you who are... Okay, I heard weary and heavy laden. Those are words of Jesus found in Matthew. Do you find any other words in Scripture? Uh, Come to me, all you who are... Well, Isaiah and the book of Revelation say, come to me, all you who are thirsty, and I'm going to give you water and and you'll drink. Uh, Isaiah also says, if you're hungry, come to me. Uh, Revelation says that if you're blind and you can't see, come to me and I'll give you eye salve that will cure that spiritual blindness. And so there's this invitation from God from Genesis and the fall right through the book of Revelation that says, come, the Spirit and the bride say, come. And here in this word blessed, this longing that people had, I wish I had a life like that. I wish I could be like that. I love the quality of their life. There's an invitation, come to me, and I want you to know that this psalm that is put as an introduction to the psalms is an invitation to a whole new way of life that is centered around the living God and what he has told us in his word. And this word blessed captures that. You have received an invitation. God says, come. 
Are you weary? Come. Are you thirsty? Come. Are you hungry? Come. Are you spiritually blind? Come. And so this word blessed speaks of this invitation of the living God to us as well. We have an invitation to accept. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. We not only have then an invitation, but we have a decision. We have a decision to respond to. There's this contrast that is Gary read through the psalm, or as you have experienced it yourself, it runs all the way through the psalm. There's people who pursue God and people who ignore God, or worse. And that continues all the way through. It's like there is a branch that we've read. you got to either go this way or go that way, and that's what the psalms are about. You're going to go this way or you're going to go that way. Because this invitation is extended from God, he says, okay, now you've got to make a decision. The wicked or sinners or mockers are present. They are apparently, especially as we get further into the Psalms, they're influential, they're prosperous, and they're numerous. And they're part of life. This is pre-political campaign rallies. This is pre-news commentators who give way too much commentating. (laughs) The... The wicked, the sinners, the mockers are present. They're influential, they're prosperous, and they're numerous. But there's also in our psalm an assembly of the righteous. Now, here's what's interesting. When this invitation is laid out, this decision has to be made out, the alternative is not the good people versus the bad people. The the distinction is people versus the living God. Yeah, there is an assembly of the righteous, but the point of the psalm is not make sure you hang out with the right people and make sure that you uh, distance yourselves from the wrong people. No, actually what he's saying here is, the the writer of Proverbs puts it this way, the fear of man is a snare, but the one who trusts in the right people will be, (laughs) the one who trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. And so the the fork in this road, it changes our relationships with people because I'm saying I've got to find my delight and my security in God and God alone. And by the way, nobody can do that for you. Jesus Christ has prepared a way that you can come to God. Your sins are dealt with. A holy God is pleased in this one but we receive those things by this gift of faith that God gives us. And if he's given us that gift of faith, what do we need to do? Exercise it. Do something with it. And so we come by faith and we come by the righteousness of Christ, but we have a decision to make to come, to accept this invitation. Pursuing God himself is the decision that we make based on this promise. There is another way you can go. There is another way you can live. But this psalm and this entire book are calling us to a different way to live. Well, not only do we have this decision to make, oh yeah, who are these guys? Uh, I googled pictures of 49ers, and after I waded through pages of football players, I finally came up with these pictures, and don't these guys look happy? If this were a postcard, don't you think they would have said, we're having the time of our lives, so much fun, wish you were here. Uh, These are people I know not, maybe you're related to some, maybe I'm related to some of them, but they, they left wherever they were living, or even whatever country they were living in, and they traveled to California to hopefully strike it rich, gain a fortune and turn their whole lives around. And so they left wherever they were to go where the gold was. And if they couldn't find it panting in the river, then they started digging for veins in the side of the mountain. And it was hard, hot work, dusty, dirty. And most of them went home more broke than when they came. So why did they go? Now what's interesting to me is in the Psalms you will find it said, You'll find me when you search for me as you do for gold or for silver. But when it comes to our pursuit of God, sometimes we say, well, why does he, why does he have to make it so hard? Why does he just appear to me and talk to me? Why do I have to read the Bible? Why do I, like, could we have like a phone a friend thing? And yet the way that we find gold is to go where the gold is, not to critique the way the gold is there. If it's of value to you, you pay whatever price it is. 
You go search and exhaust yourself in whatever effort there may be. Is not this knowledge of God of much greater value? Because you see, if it's not, maybe that's the problem with this whole journey. It's not really him that I value, it's me and my, my convenience and my comfort, and that's why it's discomforting that I might have to read and study a book and have conversations and pursue him. I just want it to be easy. I just want it to get over with. And God wants to change our hearts. And he wants to change our values. Well, Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You suppose we could read that out loud together? Jeremiah 29 13 you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart, Jeremiah. Now I realize that's an intimidating word, all. I'm supposed to love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. On these two commands hang all the prophets. That these are the, the weightiest obligations of a created being like you and me. To love God back and love those that he's made. And so when I seek him with all my heart, I realize that's going to take all my life. What if it be worth all your life? What if the joy from what you receive and the effort you expended, even in the time in the Word and digging through and praying and say, God, I don't understand this part. I don't see how this fits with this. Will you help me understand this? What if that whole process that unfolds over years and years and decades and your whole lifespan gives you such an incredible understanding of God and his realness, you would say, you know, it's absolutely worth it all. And what if God arranged around you in the pages of your life different scenarios that you would have to walk through? If God wanted to reveal himself to you, he could choose a variety of ways, but this is his dominant way. I'm going to speak to you through the word, and in the scenario of your life, there are going to be situations where you can test me and try me and find me faithful, and you'll know me so much better, and you're going to accumulate more knowledge year by year and decade by decade that over a lifetime, you're going to say things like this, whom I have in heaven but you, and beside you I desire nothing on earth. Well, blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. We talked about the invitation, we talked about the decision, let's talk about the delight for a second here. A delight to enjoy. I want to know a question, and this is not phone a friend, this is talk behind your mask except for me. In church, can you fake delight? I think you can. Can you fake Delight. Yeah, can you fake delight? Can you fake delight for long? Eventually, it'll be clear that's not your delight. I was thinking about that. What does it take to delight in something or someone? I am getting a course in delighting in my wife. That woman is tough. And she amazes me. And it's not because it's easy, and it's not because it's not discouraging, but I see in her this tenacity that I'd say, Peggy, God blessed me to bring us together. Now, what does it take for me to get there? Are there days where I'm not so delightful or delighted? Shall I talk about your marriage? Shall I ask your spouse? <laughs> but the deal is, as we walk together over time and we see, and if that's true for a redeemed sinner, what is it like with the holy God? in whom is no imperfection or short-sightedness or lack of love or patience, and yet day after day he puts up with us, whining and complaining about picking up free food at the restaurant? Seriously? Holy man of God who graduated from seminary? 
His law is God's revealed will understand that it's way more than the Ten Commandments. It can be a statement for all of the Old Testament, all of inspiration as well. But the writing reveals the author, and if that's the way he's chosen to reveal himself to us, if that's the primary way at this point in time, I say let's go. Let's dig in. Let's do the hard shoveling and picking because actually the hard work has already been done for us on the cross of Christ. And the indwelling spirit that he sent is is digging up the rocks and stones of our life, the resistance and the stubbornness. He confronts it in the hot sun in southwest Ohio on a Friday evening. When you're hungry. This blessedness is relational then, not simply emotional or material. This blessedness is relational. It's not just feeling better. And so, we have a delight to enjoy. The person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever they do prospers. Now, we could spend quite a little bit of time on this part right here because it sounds on the surface that everything I do should succeed. Except... Where is his delight? Where is her delight in the verses that came right before this? In the law of the Lord. And so what I am attempting, what I am going for, is in accordance with the revealed will of God who's become a delight to me. And as I walk in his steps and walk within his will, those things that I do, I'm not in those alone anymore because he's wired me to be part of his plan to bring those into fruition. Then his servants will serve him as a state of the eternity. And so whatever they do prosper because they've been shaped and molded by God and his character and his priorities to do his will. So this is actually a wonderful assurance, but it's way better than what I thought at first. God's not only going to bless whatever I do, he's going to change what I want to do. And so that lines up with what he wants for me. This person. So... Next slide, please, guys. John Calvin says this about Psalm 1. The children of God constantly flourish and are always watered with the secret influences of divine grace so that whatever may befall them is conducive to their salvation. Understand he means that in the broadest of senses. Not only saving us from eternal damnation, but saving us from the practice and the presence of sin. While on the other hand, the ungodly are carried away by sudden tempest or consumed by the scorching heat. Next slide. When he says he bringeth forth his fruit in season, he expresses the full maturity of fruit produced, whereas although the ungodly may present the appearance of precocious fruitfulness, yet they produce nothing that comes to perfection. John 15, I've chosen you and deigned you that you should bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that's why Jesus gives us the parable of the sower, because there is an initial response, but then the sun starts beating down. And then persecution comes, and the plant withers, because the faith is not a real faith. And so there's a future to anticipate. Apparently there'll be dry times. That's implied in our psalm. But with God's continual provision, He has us standing in judgment in the presence of the the righteous, acquittal of my charges for sin, complete fellowship with God and with those who delight in Him. There is the reality of opposition, sinners and, and wicked and scoffers and mockers. But the fruit that he says, well, Isaiah 5, 2, bearing the fruit that season is justice and righteousness, those actions that grow out of my love for God and my neighbor who's made in God's image. Fruit that will last. Blessed means a life that ends very well. We learn something so invaluable here. Because frankly, when my air conditioner goes out and I have to stand in line in the hot sun and somebody didn't get their tea that they needed and it interrupts my life and my inconvenience, basically what I want to do is feel better. I want to get back in my air-conditioned car, turn it up full blast on max. I want to have a cool beverage in my hand, and I want to drive for hours <laughs> until that AC unit is fixed at home. 
But that's not the kind of blessedness that's being spoken of here. It's not simply an emotional condition. But you see, too often we go running to the Word, God, give me a quick fix because I'm worried. God, give me a quick fix because I'm fearful. God, give me a quick fix because I'm angry. And we just want to have a different emotional state. And he says, I want to do way more than that. I want to go down and mess with your thinking because you've got so much distortion and so many areas of ignorance. And I want to foster a garden that has trust and faith in me. I want to weld your spirit to my spirit because you need me. You were made in my image. And so he's going to go through that. And as we learn those hard lessons, we will learn how precious it is to know him and to be his child and to have him speak to us and meet with us and to change us. Blessed is that man. It's way more than feeling better. It's being better. It's making better choices. It's loving my neighbor better, and predominantly it's loving God back. All my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength. Oh, (laughs) fifth thing. A promise to claim. Future looks great, but what about right now? Hey, read this verse with me with COVID eyes. Ready? You might need this this week, because I sure needed it last week. I'm a little fearful about the coming week. Uh, Go back to that last slide, guys. Read out loud with me. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. That's our promise that we need to claim and take through COVID times. The Lord watches over is not simply the sense like he has a security camera, but he's watching over in the sense of care and in protection and provision. I never will forget after we graduated from seminary, I say we because Peggy had every bit as much to do as I did. And we accepted our first pastor down in Iowa and the church and their goodness and grace gave us a card with a gift certificate for $100 at a local grocery store like we would need groceries. I should have thought of that, shouldn't I? (laughs) So we moved in, and here was this card with a $100 gift certificate in it. So we went to that grocery store, and we gladly spent a whole bunch of stuff threw in the cart. And when you get to the checkout line, it's probably really good to know if you have enough money or not. But I was a holy man of God. I just graduated from seminary. God has ravens and stuff like that. I'm not sure the grocery store would understood about the ravens, though. $99.56, or close to that. I know I got change and it wasn't in bills. <laughs> the Lord watches over me. The Lord guards me. He even taught us to pray and deliver us from the evil one. Oh, I bet you there are stories to tell about that one that we're going to learn in the future. But primarily his delivering us from the evil one was that there was an accuser who had the goods on us, who knew our record was full of sin and the lawlessness that we had not only in our actions, but our words and our heart as well. And throw the book at them, you're a holy God, you must judge them. If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. We have an advocate who goes before the Father for us, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And so he guards our hearts and he provides for us. I have a righteousness beyond anything I can produce, a righteousness that comes as a gift by God. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He didn't achieve it, he believed it and received it. God is my portion, my very great reward is what he said elsewhere. Or Isaiah put it this way, he arrayed me in a robe of righteousness, a promise to claim. 
So here we are in the middle of COVID, and what I want to know is where is his praise right now? I'm so glad that there's a Friday evening after a Friday afternoon. <laughs> because he brought back to my mind what he had told me in Psalm 115, that his, 150, that his praise cannot be simply a superficial act that I do and get done, but it's got to be a way that I live from my heart. I venture to say that in the coming week, or maybe even the coming day, there'll be opportunities for you to think again about your own heart condition before God. And I venture to say also that your Heavenly Father, if you've trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, is very concerned about the condition of your heart. And he will use all kinds of ways to get that your attention in that, even circumstances that overwhelm you, or health conditions that come, or family disruption, or perish the thought, broken air conditioning compressors. Because he cares about your heart. Because he cares about you. And to slap a new mood on you and to leave your heart untouched and your choices and your values untouched would be such a, a gross misapplication of his kindness and goodness and grace. And so he sends his word to us and says, read it and take it up and speak. It'll speak to your heart. Oh, search me and know me and see if there's any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You know what I think? COVID is a gift. It shook us from routine and expectation. It gave us legitimate fear. Now, could that be ultimate fear? And we had to stop and think again about what our life was about and what we were really after. Was I really satisfied with normal that I want to go back there? Or do I need to go to a greater depth in my relationship with Jesus and my hunger for his word? And he's cleared off so much of the clutter in our life. Now why don't we remake? Why don't we do? Why don't we start fresh? And it must begin with my word. Well, here's how the psalmist ended all this. Read with me. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What do you say to that? But he didn't have to. He didn't have to. And yet he issues this invitation, come, come, come. So we have a decision to make. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this day. Thank you for the words from John and Pam. Thank you the prayers for Bill. I thank you for the songs we've sung and the hands we'd like to shake and the hugs we'd love to extend. But I thank you for your son who came to bring us to you to array us in a robe of righteousness, to transform us, that all things, in fact, are working together for that good. And so I pray that in these times we may love you more and love others well. And you might be delighted in the fruit that grows on this tree in season. Toward that end, Lord, so bless us. We pray in Jesus' name.